All right, good morning. Welcome to the HIV Grand Rounds. And this Grand Rounds is hosted by UCLA CHEPS, UCLA CDUC FAR, and the UCLA AIDS Institute. My name is Oluwa Damilola Jolayani, and I work with UCLA CHEPS. Um, so today we're having an exciting presentation. Um, but before we do, I just wanted to make sure that we welcome everyone and we um, have folks triggering. So in a minute or so, I will um, get us started. But before I, let's go ahead and just like talk a little bit about what the Grand Rounds are. So the Grand Rounds are hour long lunchtime lectures that are delivered by invited guests or distinguished members of institutes, faculty on a broad range of HIV related topics. The aims of the Grand Rounds are to share the latest research findings on HIV prevention, care and treatment and highlight important developments in HIV related research, encourage scientific collaborations and networking and excite an interest in HIV AIDS research for early career investigators and provide resources about funding, career opportunities and more. Again, my name is Damila Jalayami and I'll go ahead and get us started. Welcome to the UCLA HIV Grand Rounds. And I will introduce our moderator today, Dr. Rafi Landovitz, who is also co-director of CHIPS. Go ahead, um, Rafi. Thanks, Dami, and welcome everyone. We're very excited uh, to have you here. We have an incredibly exciting uh, guest speaker today. Um, we have Dr. Emily Heil, uh, who is Assistant Professor of Medicine at Harvard Medical School, and she works at Massachusetts General Hospital. Um, so I'm not sure Emily can comment on this if we're actually allowed to be friends because I went to a competing residency program and we're not supposed to get along but I'm just kidding, we're, we're allowed to get along and it's a delight to have her here. Um, Dr. Heil uh, graduated magna cum laude um, with uh, honors in history from Williams College, attended University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine, um, then completed the program in clinical effectiveness at Harvard School of Public Health, the Gorgas course in tropical clinical medicine, um, and uh, an MSc in epidemiology at the Harvard School of Public Health. She completed her postdoctoral medical training at Mass General Hospital, was an ID fellow in the Mass General Brigham Joint Program, so we're allowed to bond over that. Um, and now as assistant professor, as I mentioned, at Harvard Medical School, she works in the CPAC group, um, which many of you may be familiar with, is um, a really exciting group that does modeling of HIV and HIV-related outcomes also HIV prevention related outcomes and a lot um, looking at cost effectiveness simulations, um, which has really informed our field, both from a clinical and a policy perspective in incredible ways that clinical trials and straight epidemiology investigations by themselves could not have done. So an incredibly powerful field and Emily has been involved in a number of these really exciting projects, including what she's gonna talk to us today about which is people aging with HIV in the United States, a simulation modeling approach. So please um, welcome Dr. Heil um, with me. We're very excited to have her here. You can put questions in the chat and we'll take questions um, at the conclusion of her prepared remarks. Emily, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks so much. It's really exciting to be with you um, and have the opportunity to talk about um, topics that are uh, I feel really passionately about and would love to, to hear your thoughts on. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen, and I think we're good there. So we'll just um, go ahead and dive right in. So I'm going to speak with you today about people aging with HIV in the U.S. using a simulation modeling approach. And here we go. My only disclosure is that I am a co-author at UpToDate. And I'm going to talk um, in a couple different pieces. So first, a little bit of background, which may be quite um, well known to you all, but just to kind of set the scene a little bit, then to move into a bit of a primer around uh, simulation modeling, um, what it is and how we use it, uh, and then talk about two different projects, one um, focused on MSM aging with HIV and the other on age-associated dementias among people with HIV. And then change gears a little bit and talk about costs um, and then leave you with some final conclusions. So this is a, um, a, a figure that will be well familiar to you, I'm sure. This is the age distribution of people with HIV in the US using CDC data in 2018. Um, across the x-axis, you see the different age buckets and each bar is the absolute number of people with 
diagnosed HIV in that age strata. And so you can see on the far right of your screen in dark blue, there are about 44,000 um, people living with HIV in the US um, who are 70 and older. And then in those um, blue stripes, you can see a very large number of people who are growing older or aging with HIV, um, almost half a million people ages 50 to 69. And that is due to a lot of different factors, all of which are really good news. Um, but this is one of them, which is declining HIV-related mortality. These data also from the CDC show the decline in mortality among people with HIV from 2010 to 2018. And that top line um, in bold blue across the top shows the total number of deaths um, in a rate. Um, and then you can really see the two lines below, the dashed line are non-HIV related deaths and the dotted line below that, which has been declining are HIV related deaths. And again, more good news that's going um, to contribute. We also know that people aging with HIV experience um, a, a large number of situations, including multimorbidity. So multimorbidity is common and it's rising among people with HIV. And both traditional and HIV-related risk factors contribute to this multimorbidity. And with multimorbidity comes polypharmacy. And polypharmacy includes risks of adverse events due to drugs and drug-drug interactions, so additional complexity in prescribing. We also know that among people with HIV who are aged 50 or older, frailty is actually very common, estimated from a recent meta-analysis to be around 10.9%. And pre-frailty is even more common at 47.2% from that same recent meta-analysis. This is similar in frequency to community-dwelling adults who are over age 65. So life expectancy of people with HIV who are engaged in care and virologically suppressed is near normal, but age-associated comorbidities are rising. And given these trends in, in multimorbidity, additional clinical complexity and costs are anticipated in the future. Simulation modeling can be used to project the future burden of comorbidities among people with HIV. And that's what I'm gonna spend the rest of my time with you talking about today. So what can we do in simulation modeling? We can use existing data to project longer term clinical and economic outcomes investigate the impact of uncertainty and data on outcomes of interest, examine which parameters have the greatest influence on outcomes, and estimate the value of specific interventions in comparison to each other. So this is a quote that will be familiar to many. All models are wrong, but some are useful. And I think we think of it a lot in terms of statistical modeling. But it's also very applicable to simulation modelings, which is they're an approximation of the truth, um, but they can still be really, really useful. So the CPAC model um, is the model that I work um, in, and it's the cost effectiveness of preventing AIDS complications, which we abbreviate to CPAC. CPAC is a simulation model of HIV disease and treatment that incorporates CD4, HIV RNA, ART, opportunistic infections, and age-associated comorbidities. Data are from public use data sets, observational cohorts, and clinical trials. And model outcomes are reported in projected life expectancy, detailed clinical outcomes, and costs. This is um, a schematic of the CPAC microsimulation model. And you can see in the top left, um, is a health state for um, people with acute HIV infection who then would progress um, through the red arrow to chronic HIV infection where they can stay month after month or experience an acute clinical event to the right and then death is possible from any of the health states. Acute clinical events can be either opportunistic infections or age-associated comorbidities. And we have, um, it's kind of like, I describe it like a, a video game almost um, in terms of it all takes place within a computer and you have um, simulated people who move through one at a time and experience uh, life within the model. And so the stick figure that you see um, here is an example of one of those people who is assigned an age, gender, a CD4 count and an HIV um, RNA level. And then that person, simulated person, moves through the simulation one month at a time, now having an acute clinical event, and now experiencing death. 
And so the next patient will now move through uh, the simulation until all of the people who were simulated have completed the simulation, at which point there is a calculation a summary of clinical events that were experienced, life years, transmissions, costs, a wide range of different um, outcomes can be calculated from the simulation. We have a large group within CPAC now. CPAC Adult, both US and international, was founded and is led by Dr. Ken Friedberg. And we have collaborations in South Africa, Cote d'Ivoire, India, Brazil, Zimbabwe, Botswana, Mozambique, and other places. Um, it's uh, always um, a little odd to me in the past year to have this slide without also mentioning Rochelle Walensky, who was a vital part of CPAC for a long time until um, she moved to her current role at the CDC. I. Um, I have been working in aging and comorbidities and leading efforts there. Dr. Krishna Reddy um, has been working in smoking and TB. Um, Drs. Andrea Cirinello and Caitlin Dugdale have been working in CPAC pediatrics and questions of perinatal transmission. Dr. Ann Nealon is leading efforts around adolescents and young adults. And my mentee, Dr. Amir Moharab, and I have been working in hepatitis B natural history and treatment as well. So it's a very broad um, group of investigators, um, and we have different focus areas um, where, uh, where we really uh, work. So why is simulation modeling um, helpful and important? Uh, Rafi had mentioned um, earlier that it can be a great extension of epidemiology data um, and can have real policy impact. So this is an example um, from a long time ago now, but um, in the in the 1990s and early 2000s, the CDC actually had very restricted HIV testing recommendations, including um, recommending uh, HIV screening only in settings where the prevalence would be greater uh, than 1% um, or targeted testing based on, on risk assessment. Then in February of 2005, two separate and distinct modeling papers were published in the New England Journal, um, one by, led by um, David Paltiel and Rochelle Walensky from the CPAC group, and another led by Jillian Sanders and Doug Owens. And both separate models found that expanding screening for HIV in the US um, would be clinically effective and would be um, cost effective as well. And those findings were a major contributor to uh, updates in the CDC recommendations released just the next year in September 2006, um, in which they revised those recommendations around HIV testing and screening. This paper was written by my mentee, Dr. Yanis Kulias, um, around whether we should be testing for baseline integrase resistance in patients newly diagnosed with HIV. Um, we published this paper in June of 2017 again, using a modeling approach to investigate the clinical implications and costs of um, integrase resistance testing in all newly diagnosed people. And um, part of those findings were incorporated among with other evidence into the DHHS guidelines around um, which types of drug resistance testing should be, uh, should be included for all people um, newly diagnosed with HIV. Again, with the caveat, if specific NCD resistance being a concern, then private provider should test for it. And um, this paper was just recently published, a collaboration between Dr. Ann Nealon and Dr. Landovitz as well, um, around looking at the cost effectiveness of long-acting injectable HIV pre-exposure prophylaxis in the US. And I look forward to its policy implications in the coming months and years. So let's delve into two specific um, modeling projects that we've done um, uh, that I would love to share with you. So um, we were interested in projecting the burden of age-associated comorbidities among people with HIV in the US, but we felt like we first had to examine the face validity of model projected numbers and age distributions of people aging with HIV. So um, in order to focus this analysis, we chose to focus initially on MSM with HIV as the largest group of people with HIV engaged in care in the US. And so the objective was to use CPAC to project the numbers and the age distribution of MSM on ART from 2021 to 2031. And this is how we did it. Um, we first set the model to simulate the HIV care continuum. And so we used CDC data from 2014 to initiate the model. Um, and you can see the bracket on the left-hand side for prevalent 214, uh, 2014 data around MSM with HIV in the US. So the two bars at the bottom show the cohorts of MSM who are on ART in 2014 on the left bottom, and MSM who were diagnosed but out of care on the right. 
And then across the top, you have a white band of MSM who have HIV but are not yet diagnosed. So they're prevalent cases in 2014, but don't yet know of their infection. And then every month after that, when we initiate the uh, simulation, we add a new number of um, MSM newly infected or incident with HIV who add and contribute to the overall population every month. So as the model progresses, you can see those red bars are moving across um, the white bars to show that increasing numbers of MSM in the undiagnosed cohort or in the incident cohort are now becoming diagnosed and folding into care either on ART or, um, uh, or out of care for a period of time. These are a selection of the cohort characteristics at model start. So for the incident cohort, um, we relied on data um, around the initial CD4 count of people who've been recently um, infected with HIV at 667 um, cells per nanoliter and at an age of 33.7 with a wide standard deviation. And the number of incident cases is determined by transmissions um, within the model. Um, for 2014 uh, undiagnosed MSM, we um, used data from the CDC around uh, an initial CD4 count of 436 and an initial age of 34.6, um, and estimated that number to be about 109,700 people. Um, for people who are in care and on ART, we estimated their CD4 count at 600 with an initial age of 45.7 um, and estimated that number of MSM to be 370,000. And then again, people with, who knew of a diagnosis but were not currently in care and were not currently on ART um, to have a CD4 count around 325 with an age of 45.7. And that um, population was around 124,000 MSM. So this schematic shows um, what is really happening in the model, kind of under the hood of the model as the model progresses. So the big pink box are all people with HIV who are out of care. And inside of that is a blue box, which are people with HIV who are in care and on ART. So if you look at the top right, um, you see that you can enter the blue box if you become diagnosed and linked to care, um, or you can exit the blue box, bottom right, if uh, you experience death. Uh, simulated patients can also leave the in-care and on ART blue box to the bottom left if they become lost to follow-up or disengage from care, and then can re-enter the blue box and reinitiate ART uh, in care by returning to care in the top left. So you can imagine every month as the simulation progresses, those um, probabilities change and people move um, accordingly. And so on the left, if you have a situation where uh, mortality rates are high and you see that bigger red arrow to the bottom right, um, or loss to follow-up rates are higher, again, to the bottom left, then that blue box of people with HIV in care and on ART actually shrinks and grows smaller because more people are leaving. Alternatively, and what we all are, are hoping to work towards is on the right, where um, that blue box becomes very large because more people are diagnosed and linked into care on the top right, and more people who have been disengaged from care for some reason return to care in the top left. And so these were our findings um, for projecting the absolute numbers of MSM on ART in the US. You can see these are projections from 2021 to the left up to 2031 to the right, and every bar is, an is, a, is the absolute number of MSM who are on ART at the end of that year. Um, each bar is shaded in colors. From the bottom in the lightest pink are um, MSM who are under uh, the age of 30. The lighter, the medium light pink is from 30 to 49. The darker pink is from 50 to 64. And then the darkest red pink at the top is um, uh, represents MSM who are 65 years or older. And so as you look from left to right, you see that the absolute numbers of MSM on ART are slowly growing over that 10 year period. And then the um, amount and the height of those, um, that darkest red bar on the top or 65 years or older is also growing. We were fortunate to have a collaboration with the Pearl modeling team, um, who's based out of Hopkins, led by Drs. Carrie Altoff and Prastu Kasahi, um, who uh, have a, um, an agent-based model as well that's very distinct in terms of its structural um, uh, 
its, its structure and the way that it's populated. And so we were able to engage in a wonderful collaboration where we um, compared our models and we found actually an interestingly similar findings, which is a overall growth in the number of um, MSM on ART over the decade, um, as well as a um, increase in the number of people 65 and older. Um, I want to turn to another project um, that we worked on uh, using this approach um, and really based on the idea of, of looking at this aging population um, focused on age associated dementia. So people with HIV and dementia, I think is a really interesting and important question. Um, I've really condensed it down in major simplicity here to the left in a, van, in a Venn diagram where you can see there's um, a hand in the red to the top left or HIV associated um, neurocognitive disorders. Then there's VCID or vascular complications um, in the, in the uh, yellow to the top right and then Alzheimer's disease in, in blue at the bottom. For this particular analysis, we focused on the anticipated burden of age-associated dementias among people aging with HIV in the US, so in the yellow and the blue, and we did not yet tackle HAND, which I will talk about that a little bit later, but just to kind of focus everybody on what the objective of the analysis was. So our objective was to compare the cumulative incidence of age-associated dementias, which I've abbreviated to AAD, among three populations. We looked at the general US population. We also looked at people who did not have HIV infection, but would be categorized by the CDC as being at high risk for HIV acquisition. Um, and that's for an important reason that I'll explain in a second. And then the third cohort or population we looked at were people with diagnosed HIV. So this schematic shows a comparison of the simulated cohorts. On the left, you see the general population, in the middle, people at high risk of HIV acquisition, and on the right, people with diagnosed HIV. So you can see that um, we've had this in top blue, we have the same ages. For sex and gender, we have the same, um, same distributions. For the natural history, meaning prevalence, incidence, and um, associated mortality and quality of life, we used um, for our base case, the same uh, natural history for all three cohorts. And then below that in yellow, we um, had non-HIV related mortality. So all causes of, of mortality that were not directly associated with HIV. Um, and so that is not is um, li life tables um, uh, for the general population uh, in the left. But when looking at both people with diagnosed HIV and people with high risk of HIV acquisition, this uh, was estimated to be at a higher mortality rate um, using some interesting work led by Dr. Shubble in our group, um, looking at uh, mortality rates among people who've ever used injection drugs, men who have sex with men, um, and, and heterosexually active persons at high risk for HIV acquisition. Um, which uh, showed an increased uh, risk of non-HIV related mortality within, within those, um, those groups. And then at the bottom, you see HIV specific parameters and you can see for the general US population to the left and for people at high risk of HIV acquisition in the middle, there are no HIV specific parameters, but that is included in the cohort to the right for people with diagnosed HIV. So other model input parameters, we started the model uh, with people aged 55 with no age associated dementia. We developed, as I mentioned, age and sex stratified AAD incidence and mortality rates from the general population in the US. And then we estimated the HIV care continuum and virologic suppression among people with diagnosed HIV using CDC sources as I described in the past project. And these are our results. So on the left, you can see a survival curve. These are model projections. And on the right are AAD cumulative incidents over um, the 35 years of the simulation. So on the left for survival, you can see the general population is the dotted line and that has the longest survival um, followed by people at high risk for HIV acquisition in the dotted line followed by people with diagnosed HIV in the solid line for uh, cumulative incidence of age-associated dementia, you can see that for the first 10 years, um, all three cohorts had very similar cumulative incidence. But um, as 
people from the cohorts continue to age, those start to separate such that the general population actually experienced in the model um, the highest lifetime cumulative incidence for age-associated dementia, followed by people at high risk for HIV acquisition, and then people with uh, diagnosed HIV actually is at, um, at the lowest amount uh, at, that, at that time, really influenced by the competing risks um, of survival. So we were really interested in digging into how this might work. Um, and so we were able to use sensitivity analyses to do so. And so in simulation modeling, sensitivity analyses are where you take one parameter at a time and you vary it along different estimates to see the influence on the outcomes of your model. So we looked at HIV focused parameters, including loss to follow up rates. So we said, well, what if we really reduce loss to follow up? And so people were really engaged in care and virologically suppressed. Then we also looked at age associated dementia focused parameters. And in one way we looked at, well, what if among people with diagnosed HIV, age associated dementia actually had twice the incidence that's been reported um, in the general population? And then we also looked at the idea of premature aging. And so not only in this simulation would there be a uh, doubled incidence of AAD, but we also shifted overall mortality five years earlier so that again, there would be kind of this accumulation of morbidity um, and increased mortality. And this is what we found. So I'm showing you um, as I did with the past results only for males. Um, and that's because females um, had a different uh, set of outcomes, but for time, I'll just focus on showing you um, outcomes um, for, for men with HIV. So um, on the left-hand side for survival, you see in the blue dots um, that overall survival among people with diagnosed HIV improves pretty markedly um, when loss to follow-up is, is uh, reduced. And you see the implications of that on the right-hand panel with age-associated dementia, cumulative incidence is higher. And that's really entirely due to, um, to improved survival so that people are living to ages where the incidence of age-associated dementia is greater. And so you see that reflected in a greater lifetime cumulative incidence of age-associated dementias. In the orange dots, you can see um, the implications of what if age-associated dementia was actually twice as uh, incident among people with diagnosed HIV. And so survival is not that different on the left, um, but on cumulative incidence actually becomes much, much higher um, on the right. And in terms of five-year premature aging, survival has a slight influence. In fact, it's enough that you can barely see the orange dots behind the red dots, um, but there is less cumulative incidence because of that earlier mortality. So again, a competing risks um, question. So what are next steps for this project? We recognize we have a lot still to do. Um, we're looking forward to accounting for HIV specific causes of dementia, um, incorporating multimorbidity with a focus on comorbidities that can be synergistic with dementia and HIV, including cardiovascular disease and depression. And we're looking to include dementia screening, treatment and costs. Future work um, with the, uh, the, the growing model will be to examine the future impact of comorbidities and geriatric syndromes among people with HIV, including costs, to anticipate future health system needs. And then to investigate the clinical implications and cost effectiveness of different interventions to prevent or treat age-associated comorbidities. So as I promised at the start, I'm gonna change gears a little bit and talk now about some work we've done around costs. Um, which I think are really important and will play into some of these eventual model projections. So ART costs in the US, you know, the US is among all well-resourced country has the highest ART costs and the lowest rate of HIV viral suppression with only 66% of all people with HIV virally suppressed. The DHHS guidelines for ART initiation um, are split into two categories. And I'm just gonna refresh everybody's mind on this because it's important to understand um, what we did in the, in the next study. Um, so uh, there's a recommended initial regimen for most people with HIV. These are regimens that have durable virologic efficacy, favorability, um, favorable tolerability and toxicity profiles and are easy to use. 
And on the right-hand side are excellent regimens that are still recommended um, in certain clinical situations. They're effective and tolerable, but they have some disadvantages or less supporting data from RCTs. Um, and so they're still recommended uh, and they may even be preferred in certain clinical situations, um, but tend to be um, not as recommended as the, as the regimens to the left. So um, we were interested in characterizing changes to initial ART regimen costs over time, focusing on these two categories of recommended regimens. And so in this study led by, Dr. Uh, by Nicole McCann, who is uh, now getting her PhD at the BU School of Public Health, um, uh, we obtained the annual average wholesale price of ART regimens as recommended by the guidelines from 2012 to 2018. So um, this is a figure from the, the table and I'll break it down for you. Across the x-axis is the year. And so you can see there are groups of bars in each year from 2012 to the left to 2018 to the right. And there are more and more bars every year as more and more regimens have become um, available and FDA approved. The bar um, that are solid are uh, those that are um, recommended. And then with the, um, the dashed hash marks are in certain clinical situations. And the y-axis, and so the height of the bar, is the um, average wholesale price of um, an ART regimen for a year. And so you can see there's been a dramatic rise in the price of ART just from 2012 to 2018, despite all of these new regimens that are becoming available. So the um, black line at the top is the mean increase in annual price from 2012 to 2018 um, for the uh, recommended regimens. And that has risen by 34%. Um, and in the dash line for certain clinical situations, that price has actually risen by 53%. And this is far, far faster um, than the CPI for this era, which was 9%. So not... Um, not so much in the past year um, where we have had so much inflation, but certainly in this time period, um, these rises were dramatically greater than inflation. So who pays for ART among aging um, people with HIV and um, how are these ART rising prices um, going to um, potentially have an impact? So Medicare Part D, you know, approximately 25% of people with HIV in clinical care are enrolled in Medicare. Most are uh, also enrolled in Medicare Part D for prescriptions. And there's a very complicated cost sharing structure in Medicare Part D that obscures who will bear the burden of these high ART prices. Mm -hmm. So this schematic from a paper um, that came out two years ago now shows how over the year, um, Part D cost sharing between the patient, insurance plans, the manufacturer, and Medicare um, will un unfold for people uh, with ART. So you can see um, each bar uh, are costs over the month, and um, it's an average of about $3,000 a month. Um, and you can see in the early months of the year, the patient actually has many more um, out-of-pocket expenses that then decline over time because they've reached their cap. Um, and then there is um, there are additional parts that are paid either by the plan or from the manufacturer, um, but that Medicare will end up um, covering a large percent of, um, of this. And that does lead to um, substantial inequities in Medicare Part D cost sharing. So um, with standard coverage, the annual out-of-pocket costs are substantial, $3,300 to $4,400 a year. There are low income subsidies that are available, but they vary depending on a person's income. So even at just 135 to 150% of the federal poverty level, Medicare beneficiaries are required to pay 15% of ART costs. And these higher ART costs, uh, prices do result in greater costs that are then assumed by Medicare beneficiaries or other government payers such as um, Ryan White, or that should say Medicaid. Um, I would emphasize that um, because of the Ryan White program and an other patchwork of, um, of mechanisms for payment, um, many people with HIV are not paying out of pocket, um, but these costs are being assumed by those other um, patchwork of, of coverage, which means somebody is paying and it, and it really is the taxpayer in those cases. So those ART prices are being borne by uh, the population as a whole, and in some cases by people with HIV themselves, and that is 
in my mind, a very big uh, challenge and problem. Especially when we think about the anticipated growth in Medicare beneficiaries living with HIV by 2033. So here's that um, uh, diagram that I showed that figure from earlier in my talk. When you think about in just by 2033, everybody who was in aged 50 in, uh, in 2018 will have aged into Medicare. Um, so even if they were not eligible for other reasons before by age, they will be. And so that will result in almost 500,000 Medicare beneficiaries just by age alone um, by 2033. So um, Dr. Jose Figueroa, who's a hospitalist and health services researcher at the Brigham and uh, School of Public Health uh, in Boston, is a collaborator of mine. And, and we were really interested in looking at um, uh, the association of HIV with healthcare spending among Medicare beneficiaries. So we looked at the 2016 Medicare claims data and we compared Medicare spending among two groups, people without HIV, and that comprised about 4.5 million people, and people with HIV, which in this subset of Medicare claims um, was 21,564 uh, beneficiaries. And this is what we found. So um, each set of bars is a different set of Medicare spending. If you start all the way to the left, you'll see the total spending. The tall bar in aqua are people with HIV, and in gold, which is a much smaller bar, are people without HIV. And you can see um, that people with HIV uh, for mean risk-adjusted spending, um, we're spending, we're, we're costing Medicare around $50,000 a year, in contrast to people without HIV um, at about $18,000 a year. And what's really interesting is that the bulk of that, that whole delta, is actually really mostly due to total drug spending. Um, and that's really the cost of ART is really the difference. Um, and you can see that in the next set of bars, the total drug spending. Um, there were not as big differences in um, spending on other medical conditions, about 17%. Um, and then, um, and it's much, much smaller differences um, or relatively small absolute differences in HIV associated conditions and infections and even in mental health disorders. So we were interested in looking more deeply among um, Medicare beneficiaries um, with HIV. And what we found was that in this um, selection of 2016 data, not all Medicare beneficiaries with diagnosed HIV were being prescribed ART. So out of 100% of all the sample um, with HIV, there were about 9% in red at the top that over this 12 month period were never prescribed ART through their Medicare Part D benefit. So of the 91% who did have at least some ART prescribing over the year, um, there still was almost 47% who were prescribed less than 12 months of ART, so not a full year. Um, and really only 51% um, who were prescribed um, 12 months of ART over the year. So we were really interested in why this might happen because we all know everybody should be prescribing ART to anybody um, with HIV. So why was this not happening? We found that um, people with HIV who had no ART spending from their um, Part D benefit actually had more comorbidities. And, um, and we looked at the spending um, to, to, uh, to, to look more carefully at where the spending was happening. And so what you can see is for the total spending, again, all the way to the left, the gold bar patients without HIV, um, and then the, the aqua colors are ranging from people with HIV who never received any ART in that 12 months, all the way to the left, all the way up to the lightest aqua, which were people with HIV who received um, prescriptions for 12 months of ART. And you can see that the total spending actually goes up. And then if you look at the next set of bars, it's really, um, the Delta really is due to the, to the drugs. And so it's really the cost of ART that's driving higher spending um, among people with HIV who are prescribed ART as they should be. So people who were prescribed ART ended up with less Medicare spending on mental health and other uh, medical comorbidities than people who were not prescribed ART. And this is something that we're really looking into now. So next steps in these projects are we're going to look at multi-year data over time um, and really delve into this to better understand why this is happening. 
We're also interested in incorporating costs into CPAC and the work that we've been doing in modeling. Um, and so the estimated costs of care from Medicare and other uh, mechanisms are going to be used to populate the model. And then each clinical event will be associated with a cost that includes any relevant visits, labs, medications, et cetera. And how will we use model projected costs? Well, we'll project the total direct medical costs incurred by people with HIV over a specific time frame, both for HIV and non-HIV related clinical care. We'll be able to compare the costs of different subpopulations of people with HIV, and then also compare the clinical outcomes and costs of different interventions so that we can examine the cost effectiveness of one intervention compared with others and use these as evidence um, to advocate for improved uh, care models for people with HIV. So in conclusion, people are aging with HIV will grow in number given the effectiveness of ART. Multimorbidity is a major issue and will increase as people age and screening and treatment strategies are essential. Costs will grow and there will be a direct impact on people with HIV themselves due to out-of-pocket costs for some, as well as on taxpayers through Medicare, Ryan White and other, um, other uh, payers. And simulation modeling is a method to examine and investigate interventions that are clinically effective and could be cost effective. Um, and I hope that I've spent some time today uh, convincing you of that. Um, I'm fortunate to work with a really great team um, that's very large, and I want to give a particular thanks to Ms. Acadia Thielking, who helped me with these slides, um, as well as everybody else um, who it's my privilege to collaborate with. Um, and thank you so much for your attention. I'm really happy to take questions. Emily, thanks so much. That was really, really outstanding. Um, and you covered a lot of ground um, in that presentation. So we have a, a wide range of questions uh, that were coming in uh, throughout um, that I'd like to sort of have you expound on a little bit, just, you know, sort of coming back to your most, the last data that you uh, presented, um, uh, it, can you comment a little bit about whether uh, you use the ART prescription rate based on all people living with HIV in Medicare, including those under age 65 or just those 65 and older? And what, what did you use to, to, for the other inputs into the modeling that, that you did for that Medicare analysis? Yeah, great question. So for that particular Medicare analysis, we used all Medicare beneficiaries. So some, many actually um, for the population were under the age of 65. Um, I didn't show, the numbers are too small to really stratify by that. Um, so uh, everybody there was um, grouped together under people with HIV. Um, in the multi-year analysis that we're working on now, we are looking at um, teasing that apart as there are more uh, contributions to the data. Um, for, for that particular analysis, there was no modeling in that analysis. That is all just the Medicare data. Um, and so we didn't incorporate it yet into the model, but that is um, certainly what I'm hoping to do. So, so that's interesting. Could you comment a, a little bit about um, this observation that you made from that Medicare data um, that the costs are so heavily driven by medication costs. Um, what do you sort of see as the, as you publish these data is going to be the message to sort of Congress and other policymakers about drug prices, particularly with regard to HIV? Yeah, so I mean, I think that is really a huge question. And I think as we see more people successfully aging, which is great and entering Medicare, um, that burden of ART costs at $40,000 a year is really extreme because that's lifelong care. It's absolutely essential. We know that everybody should be on ART for every day. Um, with, with no exceptions, and that is a huge cost burden. And Medicare cannot um, negotiate drug prices. Um, and that, I think, is a major area for advocacy. So, Emily, so I know the CPAC group has sort of played in this space before going toe to toe with policymakers and even pharma companies quite directly 
about these issues of drug pricing. Um, uh, are you all sort of planning any sort of op-ed or opinion piece that's going to derive out of some of these analyses? Um, yes, I think we we are moving towards that direction. I think um, people have been talking for years around how high ART prices are within the U.S. Um, and it is a really important question. I realize why R&D is important, um, but uh, the cost for that I think is being both incurred by um, by people living with HIV for those with incomes where they're not eligible for certain subsidies um, is, is extreme. Um, and the total uh, accumulating cost um, for the federal government is also going to be rising for sure. It does seem like it's an endless spiral, right? Well, you know, when we set out to do that initial project, we, I think in some ways, we knew what we were going to find because we've been seeing the rising prices in ART. This is Nicole McCann's study. Um, but, but the idea is that as you have more and more drugs that come to market and that are excellent and well tolerated, you really should see costs go down. Um, and so uh, one of the reasons that Nicole and others were motivated for that analysis, and I was excited to be a part of it, is because it really shows that as more drugs were coming to market, those prices were actually going up. Isn't that a little paradoxical, though, not only because more drugs come to market, but many of the ones that are driving the costs um, should be coming off patent protection. And so you would think that generics might be slightly lower cost. I know we struggle in this country with generics not always being as inexpensive as we would hope, but you would think that would be the pattern. And Tom Bellin uh, from the methods group here at CHIPS is sort of pointing out that that's a little paradoxical, isn't it? It's very paradoxical. Um, and I would say part of that is that we had a number of new excellent regimens that came to market and were protected over that period of time. So all of the second generation INSDs, which are the recommended regimens, um, you know, came to market then they're not yet uh, generic. Um, and so there is that balance of kind of what are the best drugs and the recommended regimens versus the recommended in certain clinical situations. But I would emphasize, I agree with you, Tom, you know, we were really surprised that among the, the certain clinical situation regimens, you would have expected those numbers to, those prices to have come down. And they, they really didn't um, through a variety of different ways um, in terms of recommending branded over generics and um, uh, some of the complexity around co-formulations, et cetera. Thanks. Um, someone is wondering, um, and I think I know the answer to this question, um, if your analysis only included FDA approved ART, if it was in the Medi Medicare database, I would imagine it would have to, right? Because investigational drugs would not be at cost to anyone, they would be as part of a clinical trial and shouldn't be costed in the same way. Is that right? That's right, that's right. Yeah. Okay, um, going back to your MSM analysis of MSM and aging. Um, so just very personally, I would love to hear what you're gonna be doing with hand. Are you sort of at liberty to talk about that at all? Um, I am. I am kind of deep in the literature around hand right now in terms of thinking through how we're going to include it. You know, one of the complexities with hand is fluctuating courses that many people experience. And so, you know, unlike age-associated dementias where there's this kind of inexorable progression, um, hand really has a fascinating um, and challenging interplay of diagnosis and waxing and waning and probably multifactorial. So that's early in development. Um, so it's a great question and I'd love to talk to people about it because um, I think it is, it is really complicated. And, and, you know, as you think about it, you know, how do you disambiguate, you know, the contribution of sort of organic hand, whatever that sort of mechanistically entails versus sort of mental health and substance use disorders that so often coexist in, in a lot of populations that we end up studying? Absolutely. I think the interplay with depression is incredibly important. And that's one of the reasons, um, one of the elements that I'm eager to expand within the model is depression and mental health, because there is so much important interplay um, for progression um, of diseases, as well as um, important interventions that we need to advocate for um, uh, and, and because of the, of the multifactorial benefits. Um, so I think there, there's a lot um, to, to do there. 
it, it seems like that would be particularly challenging to model because figuring out what the data sources for model inputs, I, I imagine, um, are challenging. Have you begun sort of looking into that? For hand or for depression? Well, depression. I was thinking depression specifically. Yeah, so there have been some successful models around depression um, that uh, that have been really interesting. So um, I think we will be relying on on some of those data that are um, publicly available in the ways that we've built um, the dementia as well. Um, but I think what's challenging both for dementia and um, depression when you think about uh, modeling is that their disease um, progression really uh, is very population dependent. There's such a wide range, right? Whereas um, I'm I'm an I, I'm an HIV clinician as well, and so there are certain things where they you know CD4s go down and uh, CD4s go up and viral loads go down and up, and so there's a certain kind of level playing field when you design the model for um, the movements of those of 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 the disease progression, that when you're thinking about some of these other non-communicable diseases, but especially where there's a lot of interplay, um, it can be really uh, challenging. Yeah, we, we have a lot of expertise within the CHIPS group on mental health and substance use disorders. So I'm sure people are, their, their brains are churning about, you know, um, what might be other applications of you know, the model as, as we think about some of these challenges of comorbid substance use and mental health disorders. So I suspect you maybe get a lot of follow-up from people about, you know, opportunities to partner on future modeling exercises as you look into these sort of neurocognitive issues. So stay tuned for that. Um, we did have um, a question about um, your MSM analysis about first why you chose to focus on MSM specifically, did it have to do with just the epidemiology in the US or were there other things that made you sort of focus on that population? And did your modeling sort of take into consideration trans men as well as cisgender men? And how did you think about yeah, that? Yeah, that's a really important question. So um, we ended up selecting um, one group to focus on among all the HIV acquisition risk groups, um, really just because we wanted to focus in on the epidemiology and um, wanted to kind of not have so many things going on, but just really have it quite focused. And so um, that's why we ended up focusing that first analysis on MSM. Um, it is the, the overall largest number um, of people who are in care, engaged in care with HIV in the US. And so that's why it seemed like the right place to start. In no way was it meant to reflect that there's not interest in um, other groups or that even that that's a homogenous group of people, because it certainly isn't. Um, but that is why we ended up at first selecting um, selecting that, that group. Um, it is... Um, cisgender MSM are um, how we drew the data from. And again, because we were interested in absolute numbers um, and aging, that's that's the reason why. I think it will be a really important and interesting analysis to look at for transgender men or transgender women. Um, again, people who use injection drugs or who have ever used injection drugs. And these are all incredibly important um, assessments and analyses to do. Um, we just happened to select MSM to start. Makes sense. Um, and certainly, probably you have the most robust data also to populate the model parameters. Um, can I ask um, uh, someone again with a methods eye towards how you constructed your model? Was wondering how you chose your age group brackets for the MSM analysis. Was it with a vision of how Pearl had done it, so you could collaborate, or was it sort of independently? sort of um, come up with, and there was a happy coincidence that they used the same uh, buckets. No, we actually, it was really interesting to work with the, the Pearl team because they have certain ways that they do things in their model and we have ways we do it in our model. And there was a lot of discussion about like, well, I can't do it that way, but I'd like to be able to compare things. So there was a lot of that discussion, which I think is really healthy in modelings because, um, you know, models can be a bit of a black box. And so when you're really forced to look in and say, you know, why do we do it that way? Nobody's asked me that before. It was really, really excellent collaboration for that. Um, I actually have a more straightforward answer um, around that, which is that we just kind of made some choices around those age groups. So um, I think what's interesting is we initially had it as 55 plus as being kind of that largest, oldest age bracket. 
And over the course of the of the project, which has taken several years, we realized that that really actually wasn't the most interesting and that actually looking at an older group at 65 plus would be a lot more interesting in terms of how people increasingly are defining um, persons of older age living with HIV. Um, but we could very well have made other stratifications. We just felt like too many then becomes kind of hard to see. Um, and so that's really where we're why we settled on those. As someone who's approaching that older age bracket, I'm particularly sensitive to those decisions. Um, but um, again, another methods related question, um, are you aware of any robust models that have considered hand, um, especially since a and I might, might under, be underestimated without routine screening? Yeah, and I mean, I think we all know ANI is definitely underestimated. Um, so I don't actually um, know of any simulation modeling models that are looking at hand in particular. I expect we're going to see them emerging in the coming years because people are really interested in this and need to be. And I think, I think there's um, a growing understanding that simulation models um, are not perfect, but they can be helpful in seeing what are important elements that need more investigation. Um, so I'm really excited to work in this area. Um, and I, I'm sure there are other models that are looking at it, but I don't know of any specific um, simulation models that are looking at uh, at hand yet. Super interesting. And of course, we're all hoping that there's going to be an intervention that is shown to be impactful on hand, which we don't have yet. Um, so, I, so we're getting to the very end of our time together, but I'm going to, um, with your permission, ask a very self-serving question that I hope you can pontificate about um, briefly. You know, you did that really beautiful work looking at the cost efficacy and the utility of integrase genotyping um, as part of an initial therapy. Now with the rollout of cabotegravir for PrEP, um, that's sort of going to be turned on its head a little bit, isn't it? And as there's scale up and roll out of that, you know, the observation that people who do fail cabotegravir prep, albeit rarely, do have integrase resistance may change the calculus um, of, you know, the utility of routine integrase genotyping before starting treatment or in modifying treatment. Are you planning to redo that modeling exercise or how are you yeah. thinking about <laughs> that? It's such an interesting question and it's been coming up a lot. You know, I think in my mind, it really speaks to the need for surveillance. Um, and I think we have to make a clear distinction between surveillance data that are essential to know what, um, what is happening um, compared to to strongly recommending it or making it a, um, you know, a requirement for um, clinical care for every patient um, entering care. And so in my mind, even with that risk, which is real, and we need to, to know what it is, um, the, the, um, the rate of substantial, meaningful integrase resistance among people entering care remains very low. Um, whether that's going to change, I think, needs to be monitored and better understood, um, as well as recognizing that a one-time integrase genotype is not a very costly test. And so having it um, and having it in your back pocket and knowing about it is um, potentially more clinically effective. Um, and so I think that is, especially if integrase resistance does rise, I think that would really tilt things. I do think it's also, though, important to recognize with integrase resistance that the, the specific mutations are really important. And so um, one of my concerns with integrase resistance testing is if people will see it and just say, oh, I can't use an integrase inhibitor at all for patients and actually um, stop using these really incredible medications um, because they see some, some mutations as opposed to its interpretation. So I do think that will be an important part of the discussion as well. Yeah, and you know the WHO is actually sort of pondering this exact question right now and trying to figure out, number one, what they're gonna recommend for or against the use of cabotegravir prep based on the available data in places where, you know, sort of the FDA recommended testing algorithms aren't available. Um, and then what do you do in terms of first line treatment with people who failed that, right? Where TLD globally is the first line treatment regimen and what's the likelihood that that's gonna be effective versus second line regimens, which have supply chain issues and toxicity and cost implications, super complicated. And I wouldn't wanna be running those models, but 
Um, have you seen Andrew Phillips' model where he's looking at sort of the global implications of cabotegravir prep rollout? And, you know, he's sort of, you know, modeling, you know, that there is going to be an increase in integrase resistance. Um, uh, but he thinks overall, um, he has some preliminary results to suggest um, actually still benefits in overall survival. Yeah, I, we have some preliminary findings as well. Um, we've been looking at this for a bit and, um, uh, and I think we will, we will end up similarly to, uh, to Andrew's thinking, which is that the vast benefits of INSTEs are such that, um, that even with some, some increasing in resistance that, uh, they still will have overall long-term benefit. Yeah. So Emily, thank you so much. It's been really great to have you. We did have one or two other questions that we're not going to have time for. If it's okay with you, we'll send them to you and you can sort of get back, um, with written responses. Is that Okay. Absolutely. Um, that's great. And I put my email up on purpose. So I'd be happy for anybody to email me. And um, it's really great to get feedback and comments and, and questions. So thank you. Okay. Well, we'll definitely follow up with you. And I'd like to thank everybody who attended um, uh, for coming to today's grand rounds. Please remember to complete your evaluation, leading the link that Dami's put in the chat. Um, and also the recording of this presentation and the slides will be posted to the CHIPS website and information about it will be emailed to everybody who registered. And again, Emily, thank you so much for spending an hour with us. It's really wonderful to have you. Thank you so much. Thanks everyone and great okay. questions. Thanks everyone, have a good day.